Eh, ora è il momento di Debbie Franco, veramente l'onore di introdurre Debbie Franco, California Governor's Office of Planning and Research. Eh, Debbie Franco è consigliera appunto presso l'ufficio pianificazione e ricerca del governatore dello Stato della California, fa parte della task force della California sui temi della siccità, eh, partecipa al team che ha sviluppato l'atto di gestione sostenibile delle acque sotterranee e supervisione il comitato direttivo di sviluppo economico e rurale. Col suo intervento raggiungere la resilienza idrica in California ci presenterà una descrizione delle attuali condizioni e delle sfide sulla gestione delle risorse idriche nello Stato californiano. Passerà quindi a una proposta per andare verso un sistema di gestione dell'acqua più flessibile incentrato su migliori equilibri. Infine mostrerà diverse ipotesi tramite le quali è possibile promuovere la, la resilienza idrica in uno Stato importante eh, come quello della California. Thank you, Debbie Franco. The floor is yours. Buongiorno. Um, that is probably the best of my Italian, I apologize. <laughs> uh, first, I want to thank uh, the Italian government and the conference organizers for organizing this wonderful event. We cannot talk enough about climate change and in particular water. Um, and uh, we welcome in California the opportunity to turn this dialogue into action. I also uh, want to start by apologizing to the interpreters because I tend to speak very fast and use many English colloquial phrases that are difficult to translate. I will do my best to speak more slowly and to explain my colloquial phrases. I, um, I also hope that you will uh, allow me to know you a little bit better um, by allowing me to ask a few questions and have people show their hands. Um, I'm curious to know how many people here are from, who traveled from outside of Italy to come to the conference. And do, can you just shout out where you're from? Virginia. South Africa. Switzerland. I, I see Americans, <laughs> at least two. <laughs> um, it's, it's very helpful to know uh, where folks are from. And, um, and also, who has been to the United States? That's wonderful. I'm, I'm glad you had the chance to visit. And how about who has been to California? Oh, excellent, excellent. So um, I am very grateful to have had the opportunity to travel here to Italy with my husband. Um, my husband is actually the smartest person that I know. I, I may be biased, um, but, but I very much respect him. He um, used to be the head man of an indigenous tribe in California. And, um, and I have sat and listened to him speak many times, and so I very much appreciate his advice about public speaking. He, um, when he would speak on behalf of his tribe, he would tell the story from the very beginning of time, every time he spoke. And that was very important because by telling the story from the beginning of time, you understand the interconnectedness of everything. And you repeat it over and over so that you never forget. I asked him for advice on how I should present this all to you, and he said, Cut to the chase. And that means, <laughs> a colloquial phrase, um, and that means get to the point. So I'm going to begin actually by telling you up front the three things that I hope you'll remember about my comments here today. The first thing is that interconnectedness, understanding and implementing our understanding of interconnectedness is what I believe to be our greatest challenge in meeting the demands of climate change. The second thing I'd like you to remember is that the indigenous peoples of our planet have a lot to offer to teach us about how we are interconnected with each other and how we are inter interconnected with everything on the planet including the bacteria we heard about yesterday, including, in fact, every little molecule of water. And finally, I want you to know that California stands with you. We, we are 
at the front lines, looking to do everything we can in collaboration with everyone in the world who is willing to meet the demands of climate change. You may have heard that our governor, Governor Brown, will be holding a climate action forum in September, and I hope that many of you will join us. We will actually have a water pavilion there, and so we will have an opportunity to continue this conversation. So I thought I would begin um, by saying a little bit about the conditions in California, very much like Italy. We, um, we know for sure that the temperature is rising. We, um, we know that we're having higher storm surges. Um, we also know that we are having less frequent but more dramatic uh, storm events. Um, we are anticipating, in our, and we had our lowest snowpack year ever in 2015. Um, and, and as we go through, we, we, are, we move toward things that we're less sure about. And the thing that we are the least sure about in California is how precipitation will fall in the future. And that creates a challenge to figure out how to act in the face of uncertainty. Declining snowpack is certain, and, and really, if we don't know how much precipitation will fall, what we do know is that more will fall as rain. And what that creates is a management challenge for California. I am probably a lone voice in California, but I keep reminding people that we have a great deal of water in the state of California. We are not water poor. Even in our worst drought, we are not water poor. The challenge is to use every drop wisely. So we know that we have an opportunity to address this. We know that we will probably have about two-thirds of our current snowpack in 2050 and about a third in 2100. That means that where we used to store water in our mountains and forests, we have to figure out where those drops go in the future. As I mentioned, precipitation is less certain. These quotes all come from a one-year period where you have one set of researchers saying, we will probably be wetter. And then you have another group of researchers saying, no, no, we will be drier. And then you have another group of researchers saying, no, it's just gonna be very complicated. <laughs> so precipitation becomes, in my mind, an opportunity, an opportunity to learn together. What we also know for sure is that California is also experiencing many catastrophic events and many, one right after the other, again, very much like Italy. We've had um, historic tree die-off. Uh, our forests in California will never look the same, at least not in, in many generations. Um, we've had, we've had um, floods and landslides and drought, um, and these are all things that cause human suffering. And, and we've heard echoed throughout the last couple of days the, the point that this is really about limiting human suffering. And so we certainly know that we have reason to act. So um, I'm not gonna talk about all of these, um, and, there, and there certainly are many more things, and I'm glad that Brian showed uh, our um, map of California and the conservation efforts that are going on. Um, while there's certainly still room for progress, we've been making great strides in urban water conservation and in on-site reuse, um, things that Brian touched upon. Um, one of the areas that I think we're innovating in is our interest in managing water at the watershed scale. Actually, one of the things I think we, we stand to learn from Italy is how you consolidated your water systems. We actually have more than 3,000 water systems that serve water to communities in California, um, and that certainly is a challenge. We have invited our water agencies to come together in regions and to do what we call integrated regional water management planning, and the idea is to bring people together in the same watersheds, to be able to collaborate, to be able to be more strategic in how they manage every drop of water. Um, this has created opportunities for things like the picture that is uh, in the watershed square, 
Um, that is actually what we call pond and plug. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a very wonderful term, but, um, but basically what's happened is, is because we have changed the hydrology in our watersheds, our river systems don't work the way they used to and the way they're supposed to. And so water moves much too fast and it doesn't have an opportunity to sink into the groundwater. And so in our upper watersheds in particular, we've been making an effort to recreate some of what should have should naturally occur by creating these um, these ponds that will slow the water down, will allow the stream to meander more, and will provide an opportunity to replenish our groundwater systems, which are one of the most difficult things to manage. You can't see the water, and so people take it for granted. Um, at least our rivers, you can see it. So you can take people there, you can show them, look at how beautiful this is and how important this is, groundwater. You can tell them underneath you, there's a really important resource, but it's hard to, um, to get people excited about. Um, however, in California, we have gotten excited about groundwater. Um, it, I'm gonna skip over to the groundwater box. Um, so, uh, someone had a slide earlier in the conference that said, uh, start with what's necessary, do what's possible, and soon you'll be doing the impossible. And I think that's the story of groundwater in California. Uh, everyone looked up and, th and, and there, was nodding head, there were nodding heads saying, oh, we have got a major problem. We were in the beginning of what we, we anticipated could be the millennial drought for California. And our groundwater aquifers, we, we were afraid we might get to the bottom. And that was really scary. So there was a clear need to act. Um, and some of us just started talking to people to figure out what was possible. And we started building the possible. And ultimately, we were able to pass the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, which was historic legislation in California. In 100 years, we had not been able to get our arms around groundwater management in a meaningful way. And it also demonstrates a shift in, in our policy strategy where many of our regulatory programs are designed basically to tell people how to do stuff, how, when to monitor, what standards they have to meet, what they have to do if they don't meet them. In SIGMA, which is our Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, we have acknowledged that the people who have to figure this out are the people who live there, <laughs> the people who use the water. And so we have, we have invited each of our high and medium priority basins, groundwater basins, to organize themselves and to determine how to manage themselves to make their groundwater management sustainable. Um, it is not gonna happen fast. <laughs> and there are many people who are frustrated because it will take time. It takes time to change people's minds and hearts and then to, to get them to act differently. But we have an, an immeasurably optimistic um, set of circumstances right now where folks who we thought would be suing right out of the gate are at the table collaborating with each other. And so we, we're very optimistic that this will be a, a new and, and a successful model. Um, I also want to say a, a few words about forest management. In California, we, it's a combination of our, our state policies and our federal policies. Um, we have failed to manage our forests well. And our forests are the drivers of our water system. And so we are struggling right now um, to figure out how we change that, how we become better forest managers. Um, and this links actually to our commitment to learning uh, from our indigenous peoples. It turns out that our indigenous peoples had been actively managing the forests of California for thousands of years. And it was when we, we, when we Westerners came in um, that we broke that chain and that set that interconnectedness between humans of that place and the forest. And so we have some initiatives to um, reinvigorate what we, we refer to as traditional ecological knowledge in the in management of our forests. And so there's, um, it's, it's still in its infancy, but, um, but we have very high hopes that we will be able to um, benefit from, from what people who live in California and who have lived there for thousands of years already know. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna say too much about urban redesign except to say that 
really fundamentally, it's about getting the water into the ground. <laughs> um, we, we have low impact development uh, policies that we encourage our communities to adopt. Um, and, uh, and we have some very innovative communities. If you do happen to come to California uh, in September, we will uh, be organizing a tour of Sonoma County, one of our most progressive counties in the state who are very actively um, doing many more things, but, but particularly urban design. Foundationally for all of this work um, is collaboration. We, um, we, we are fragmented, we believe in local control, and that's a reality of our culture. Um, and so that requires a high degree of collaboration. And so we spend a lot of resources and a lot of energy collaborating, and I think and I hope um, that we have some good models and some good uh, standards that we've created and expectations. Um, one place where we are still figuring things out um, is this connection between land use and water. We have many local governments and uh, land use entities, including our forest managers, um, among others, who, who operate in silos from our water managers. And so um, that's something that uh, I hope we can learn from the international community how to do better. So. Global Climate Action Summit. Um, again, as I mentioned in the beginning, we are hoping that we can continue this conversation in, uh, I'm sure it will be continued many places between now and September, but we hope that we can continue this conversation in September. Um, Governor Brown is very much committed to increasing global ambition toward meeting the demands of climate change, and in particular, reducing greenhouse gases. One area that I'm particularly interested interested in is the role that water can play in reducing greenhouse gases. In California, we know a lot about the water energy nexus, but I suspect that there are many other opportunities um, related to improving watershed health and watershed functioning um, that may also provide GHG benefits. And there are other obvious ones, like if you're going to restore a floodplain to sink carbon, well, gosh, you got to have the water. <laughs> and so water managers are very important for that. Um, if you want to grow food more sustainably, water management is a really important element to that. Um, and not to disagree with my colleague, <laughs> Brian, but um, I would point out that one thing we have learned in California is um, we had moved many of our farmers to very efficient drip irrigation systems. And now what we're finding is that's also contributing to groundwater overdraft because the water is not re re replenishing the groundwater aquifers. And so we're in the process now of incentivizing farmers to go back and install their old flood irrigation systems in certain strategic places so that when there is high water, that water can be captured and sunk into the ground efficiently so we can recharge our aquifers. Um, and that's, you know, that's a, a conglomeration of all of the elements for us. That's understanding that our snowpack is going to decline and that makes our groundwater storage even that much more important and a new tool an old tool used in a new way um, to be able to manage the system more effectively as more of those drops fall as rain and less as snow. Um, and thank goodness we have Sigma <laughs> to help with that. Um, as I mentioned, we will have a water pavilion. Um, I'm, I'm very excited. Uh, we, there's a company in California called Autodesk. They created AutoCAD, if any of you know architectural folks. Um, and they have agreed to host us for the duration of the, um, the climate summit. So we will have a space that water people can come and gather and we will have some programming um, that will be organized around uh, a number of topics. Um, we, we hope to bring people together internationally. We're, we're calling it the, um, uh, I just forgot what we're calling it. At any rate, um, the, a tale, we're calling it a tale of two extremes. <laughs> Uh, how I forgot that. Um, and so we will be inviting folks to come and talk about places that are struggling and the, and the challenges that they would like to have help from other countries on and places that are thriving and, and learning how they have been um, organized and thriving. And I think we have some really exciting opportunities um, to, to bring people together. We have some, some communities in South America who are actually thriving in the face of climate change who are excited to come and share their experiences. Um, and, and then of course we have many California stories which you will be able to hear so much more about um, if you can make it to California. 
So I would again like to thank you all for this opportunity and, and thank you to the conference hosts.